Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, count operations to obtain zero. This problem isn't too difficult, but it is an opportunity for us to learn a little bit about math. The idea is that we're given two numbers. They could be the same or they could be different. So let's just use this example. The two numbers are two and three. What we want to do is if one of the numbers is bigger than the other, in this case, three is bigger than two. What we want to do is take two and subtract it from three. In general terms, if we have two numbers, x1 and x2, one of them is bigger than the other. We want to take the smaller number and subtract it from the bigger number. So in this case, uh, this is what's going to happen. This number is now going to become one. And now the condition is flipped. Two is bigger than one. So we take the smaller number, subtract it from the bigger one and we're gonna end up with one. So now we have two ones, and when they're equal, we pretty much do the same thing. We just take one of them and subtract it from the other. It doesn't matter which one we subtract because they're both the same. You can do it however you prefer. But obviously, when both of them are the same, one of them's gonna end up with zero, and that's when we stop, because if we try to continue the algorithm, you're just gonna end up subtracting zero from another number, nothing's gonna happen. So that's like the terminating condition. But I'm sure you're wondering, what happens if we never reach zero? Is that even possible? Because they don't really explicitly mention that in the problem description, which is a hint to you that it probably isn't possible that we never reach zero. But why is that? And intuitively, like I'll just give a really brief explanation. No need to go into like an in-depth math proof or anything like that. But think about it like this. We have x1, x2. There's gonna be a case where they end up being equal. And when they end up being equal, for sure, one of them's gonna end up as zero. And my claim to you is that I know with 100% certainty that eventually they're both gonna be equal. Why is that though? Well, let's assume that it's not the case. Think about what that means. We have two numbers, like if they're not equal, then okay, let's consider the case where one is smaller than the other. Well, what we're gonna end up doing is taking the smaller one, repeatedly subtracting it from the bigger one until either they're equal and we assume that they're never gonna be equal. Okay, well then eventually then the condition is gonna flip, right? So it's gonna be like this. So unless these numbers are infinitely large, eventually our algorithm has to stop, right? Eventually we can't just keep subtracting. So then you're probably thinking, yeah, well maybe one of the numbers can just become negative, right? That's your claim. Well, how the hell, how the heck, sorry, is that even possible? Because we're always subtracting the smaller one from the bigger one. So basically I just gave you not really a formal proof, but I basically gave you a proof by contradiction. It's not possible for the numbers to ever become negative. It's not possible for us to go forever because we're doing a subtraction operation on positive integers. So thus, eventually the two numbers are gonna be equal. And if they're equal, then thus one of the numbers is gonna end up being zero. Zero. And just to make it more concrete, what I mean is eventually one of the numbers is probably going to hit one. And if one of the numbers hits one and the other number is any number, x2, well, just keep subtracting one from it until this one reaches one, in which case one of them is going to reach zero. I know this type of thinking really isn't required to solve this easy problem. You can just do a pretty simple simulation to solve it. But this line of thinking, I promise you, comes up in so many other problems. People skip learning these fundamental concepts like proof by contradiction, and then they wonder why they can't solve more difficult problems. So definitely try to understand what I just explained to you. But anyways, how are we gonna solve this problem? Well, we're just gonna run a very simple simulation, but we're gonna take a little shortcut, which is also gonna involve math. In this example, it was pretty simple, so we didn't really need the shortcut, but imagine we had another number instead of three, we had something like a nine, what is true is two is less than nine. So then we'd subtract from it. It's still true. So we'd subtract from it and uh, we'd get five. It's still true. We'd get three, it's still true. And then we'd get one. We can skip these extra operations because what we want to say is we want to keep subtracting two, the smaller number from the bigger number while this condition holds. And by definition, that is called the mod operator in math. We're going to take nine and divide it by two and get the remainder. The remainder will be the first number 
well, uh, maybe that's a bad way to describe it, but it'll be what's left after subtracting two from this as many times as we can. So in other words, nine modded by two is gonna give us one. That's equivalent to saying nine minus eight, which is equivalent to saying minus two times four. And the reason I'm simplifying this uh, so much is because this is important. We took two, subtracted it four times. What this problem wants us to do is count the number of operations to make one of the numbers zero, or uh, yeah, one of the numbers zero, basically. So this four is gonna be important, and that's gonna lead us to one, but this is gonna be used. So it took four operations for us to get here, and then for the simulation, we would then take two, mod it by one, which is gonna give us a remainder of zero and we're gonna count two operations it took to do that. So I think in total with that example is gonna be six total operations. So let's code that up. So the simplest solution is to keep track of the count, the number of operations, which I'm gonna call result and return that. And also to say, uh, while one of the two numbers has not reached zero, just a basic simulation, we're gonna figure out which one of them is bigger. If they're equal, it doesn't matter what we do. Uh, so we have this case and then we have the else case. With this case, like I said, we wanna take the bigger number, mod it by the smaller number, and then that will become what the original bigger number was. So that'll replace the original number. But we also want to count how many operations that was, and we wanna do that before we end up updating the number. So let's do that here. And we can do that with a division operator because at least in Python with double slashes, this should round down. So we have this and that we can add to our result. In the other case, it's just gonna be the exact opposite. So we have this is gonna be num2 divided by num1, num1 and num2, there you go. And then this will be num2 as well. So I think this is about as efficient as we can get it, but I'll show you a way to simplify the code a tad bit. So here you can see it's efficient, but first uh, let me go over a little bit of the time complexity. And actually before I even do that, let me mention that this is pretty much the same as Euclid's uh, greatest common divisor algorithm. And we actually do have a very in-depth video covering that. It's uh, this video, which only has 6,000 views, but I actually go through like an actual proof of Euclid's GCD algorithm. And so this can be rewritten as a Euclid's algorithm, which is basically a taking this problem and just reassigning the numbers so that one of them is always smaller than the other. And actually, let me just kind of write it out first and then uh, explain it to you. It's basically just gonna be eliminating one of these if statements. And then also after that, reassigning these numbers, because after we do this, we can assume that num1 is smaller or equal to num2. So then we want num1 and num2 to be swapped. So this can happen like this in Python. Now you're probably thinking like, how does this work? So let me just kind of dry run through this first of all. This is basically the exact same as before, but we don't have like an if statement this time. So you're thinking like, well, yeah, if num1 is bigger than num2, sure, this might work because it's doing the division, it's then doing the mod math, and then it's swapping them. So then we know for sure that, okay, after that, num1 is always gonna be the bigger one. But what would happen if num1 wasn't the bigger one, like on the first iteration possibly? Well, nothing's gonna happen in that case. If num1 is smaller than num2, this division will be zero. So we'll add nothing to the result. And also this mod math will also be zero. If you take a smaller number and mod it by uh, the bigger one, nothing is gonna happen. It's not gonna be zero, but num1 will not change. Num1 will stay the same. So th these two operations will do nothing. And then lastly, the numbers will become swapped. So yes, if num1 wasn't bigger, well, after this first iteration, it will become bigger, and then our algorithm should work as expected. And just to prove it to you, I'll run it, and you can see that it works. And like I said, if you wanna know why this algorithm works like for computing the greatest common divisor, you can check out the proof video I showed earlier. So in terms of the time complexity of this code, we're basically gonna stop once like the smaller of these ends up being zero. So it's the same time complexity as like the GCD uh, function because it's the same code pretty much. So it should be proportional to the log of the minimum of num1 and num2. And the reason we do log and when I say proportional to this, like there could be a constant. So in our case, like the constant, you can think of it as two because what's gonna happen after two iterations of this loop. So let's use an example. Uh, let's use nine and 17. The basic idea is 
that if you take any number and mod it by a number that's smaller than it, that number is always going to end up being, I think, like equal to half or less than what it originally was. Because think of it this way. Let's say we take this and mod it by a number that's bigger than half of it. So like for 17, nine is technically bigger than half of it. It's an odd number. So if you were to take nine and subtract it from 17 just a single time, because we can only do it a single time because it's bigger than half of it, we can't subtract nine from this twice. So we do that, we end up with eight. Okay, but if you take a number that's smaller than half of it, like eight, for example, well, then you can repeatedly keep subtracting from it. And you'll definitely be able to subtract from it more than half of the time. That's just how math works. If this is less than half of it, we can subtract it from it twice. Or um, and maybe that wouldn't be enough. Maybe we'd have to subtract from it three times. But no matter what, we'll end up getting this number multiplied by something else to be bigger than half of this. So after two steps in our algorithm, both of these will be uh, less than half of what they originally were. This will end up becoming eight, and this will end up becoming one. And so if we can guarantee that both of these are decreasing by half each time, well, that's the, the definition of log, log base two, at least. So that's where the time complexity comes from. But anyways, I probably bored you enough with the math. If you found this helpful, check out Neat Code IO for a lot more, and I'll see you guys soon.